Right then. So you've got your Bibles there open in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Look at verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. The Bible reads, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. The title for the sermon tonight is Flee from Idolatry. Flee from Idolatry. Now, if you can please go back to 1 Corinthians 5. I just... That's what I wanted to take out of that chapter, okay, in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, but please go back to 1 Corinthians 5 for me, verse number 11. 1 Corinthians 5, 11, you know, uh, the title for the sermon, like I said, is Flee from Idolatry or Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, Part 3. Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, Part 3. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 11. The Bible reads, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous, or an idolater. So that's what we're up to here. Part three, the idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such and one know not to eat. Okay, so sins that are getting kicked out of church, part three. Brethren, one of these sins that are, is considered wicked here, one of the sins that will get you kicked out of church here, is if you're into idolatry. You know, if you have idols and you worship idols. Now, here's the thing about this, uh, this sin. I actually don't expect anybody in this church to have an idol. Like, honestly, like some of the other ones, I, yeah, I might, you know, you might covet sometimes or these kinds of things, right? But when it comes to idolatry, if I believe in this church, we are made up of born again believers, saved believers, you know, especially if you've come out of some of these, you know, uh, churches like the Roman Catholic Church or some of these others where they, where they have images, where they have these idols, you know, when you, when you turn to Christ, you have to turn away from those false gods. You turn away from, from those, uh, having your faith upon those things. Uh, turn away from having your trust in those things. And if you do trust graven images, if you do trust idols, then that is idolatry. You know, and, and we're commanded not to have fellowship with someone that is called a brother, a, a member of this church, and they're doing such practices. Okay? Now, like I said, I probably don't expect most of you to do this, but I do want to, at the end of the sermon, I do want to tie this topic into something we probably all struggle with, okay? which is very similar to idolatry. Now, please go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus in your Bible, Exodus chapter 20. Let's get a biblical uh, definition for what idolatry is. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Let's see what this is tied into with these commandments of God. Exodus 20, verse 1. The Bible reads, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So we know that this is uh, God is now setting it very clear to the Old Testament nation of Israel that He is their God and they are His people. And it's a, as He enters this old covenant, you know, this covenant with Israel is making it very clear who their God is. Which God is it that brought them out of the land of Egypt? It's the Lord God. Verse number three. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. This is a very clear commandment. God says to have no other gods before him. And then he continues saying, Well, don't have these graven images. Don't have these objects of likeness of things that are in heaven or things that are in earth, the things that are in the water like fish or whatever, these animals. He says, don't create these images. Don't create these idols. Now, the first thought that might come to your mind is, oh, hold on. In my house, I've got, you know, you know someone gave me you know, a little gift and maybe it's a little bird or, you know, I've got a painting on my wall and it's, you know, it's got a giraffe or whatever. You know, you might have these little ornaments in your house that have been created you know, and they depict animals or depict other things. You know, your first thought might be, well, are these gods then? Is this idolatry? Is this, you know, and I know these are questions that cross my mind when I would think about this, but it's very clear the context which is being speaking of, right? It said there in verse number three, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so I don't believe there's anything wrong with having your little trinklets and things like that, you know, or just pictures or something like that, of an animal or something like that, as long as it is not your God. As long as it's very clear. And look, let's keep going. Verse number five. He makes it very clear. It says here, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, 
So look, I don't know, do you have a little, maybe some of you ladies, you know, you collect your little things. Maybe you've got a little animal figurine in your house. Are you bowing down to that thing? I don't know. This is where idolatry comes in, right? When you're bowing down to these things. Verse number, let's keep going, verse number 5. Nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Brethren, if you love God, you must have Him as your one true God. If you set any other gods before you, He says, what did He say there at the end of verse number 5? Uh, Visit it in uh, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. If you create an idol, if you bow down to that idol, if you serve that idol, you trust in that idol, God is saying, you hate the true Lord God of the universe, okay? And by making that mistake, it's going to have an effect on your children and to the third and fourth generation. And if you turn your hearts away from the God of the Bible, you set up some other God as your false God, that's going to have lasting effects to your children, your children's children, your children's children's children, and to that fourth generation. So this is a very important doctrine, right? Now again, I really don't expect anyone in this church to become an idolatrous. But when you read the Bible, when you read the Old Testament, how many times... Did Israel turn to their false gods, to those false gods, to those idols? You know, King Solomon, great example. You know, a man who was faithful to God, but later on when he had his multiple wives, his, the wives turned his heart toward these idols, toward these false gods. Okay? So this was a big problem in the Old Testament times. But I don't expect that same problem to be. Now, I'm not saying it will never be there. You know, the, these instructions of kicking someone out of, the, out of the church, this is New Testament times. You know, we may have, who knows in the future, someone coming into this church, bringing their idolatry, bringing their idols, and trying to turn our hearts away from the God of the Bible unto those things. Okay, so this is something, you know, even though you may say, well, this will, I'll, never, I'll never face this, well, it could happen in the future, and you know what we're commanded to do. We're commanded to kick that person out of the church, okay? So we are not to have any other gods before us. Please go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Because as we read Exodus 20, we didn't actually see the word idol in that. We saw graven images, right? We saw that term being used, the graven images. But let's go to Leviticus 19, verse 4, because God reiterates this same command in Leviticus 19, verse 4. In fact, this is the first mention in your Bible with the word idols. Okay, the first mention of the word idols in your Bible is found here in Leviticus 19, verse 4. The Bible reads, Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. So it's very clear here, the molten image, the idol that you create, idolatry is when you make that your God, when you place your faith, your worship, your service onto these objects, okay? God reinforces, you know, not the graven images, and again, not the idols. You guys are in Leviticus, please go to chapter 26 now. Leviticus chapter 26. Let's look at the second mention of the word idol in the Bible. Here in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 1, the Bible reads, <clears throat> you, shall make, you shall make you no idols, nor graven images, okay? Neither rear you up a standing image, Neither shall you put up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, so once again, he's telling us what an idol is. What is this graven image? When you create these things and you bow down, you worship these things, these are idols. And he makes it very clear at the end of verse number 1, for I am the Lord your God. And look, our Lord God is a jealous God. Remember, what does jealous mean again? It means uh, you're protective of those things that belong to you, right? And when it comes to us being God's people, when it comes to the Old Testament Israelites being the people of God, you know, they were the people of God. And their worship was to be directed to the Lord God Himself. And when that worship was given to some other objects, some creature, some false god, that brought God to jealousy. That would bring God to anger because that is what righteously belongs to God. The worship of the Old Testament Israelites and your worship, Reverend. You know, when you come to church and you sing your songs, you lift up your heart, you sing with your heart, with your mouth, hey, that's worship, that's service to the Lord God, okay? That, that's, that's a good thing to do, to open our minds, to give Him worship, to serve Him. And listen, how do we serve Him in the New Testament times? 
You serve in the local body. You serve in the church. This is the body of Christ. If you serve one another, you serve Christ. Listen, when you go and you preach the gospel to the lost, you're doing the work that Christ has left us to do. This is the service. This is the worship. This is the sacrifice that we do to the, to the God of the, of the Bible. Now, here's what's quite interesting about you know, false religion. When you think about every major false religion, guess what? They all have idols. Every major false religion in this world has idols. You know what that tells me? That tells me it doesn't matter if you're, born, if you're not born in a Christian home or not. There is something in human beings that seeks a deity. There is something in man that says there must be a God, there must be something, and they seek something to worship. And when it comes to these false religions, of course, they set up the wrong things to worship. Okay? Now, when you think of Buddhism, okay, Buddhism, I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with, I'm sure you've seen uh, certain houses having statues of Buddha. Okay? And there are different Buddha statues. Okay? And, uh, you know, sometimes you find a, a very fat Buddha. Sometimes you'll find a very skinny Buddha. I mean, there, there are different uh, styles of, of these statues. And each of these statues represents something else. Like, you know, one statue is for maybe to bless you financially. Another statue might be to scare away evil spirits or something like that. Or, or bad karma or something like that, right? But what is this? This is an idol. Say, so, well, I never see the, you know, uh, you know for, for the Buddhists, they're trusting that idol to help them. They, they've, got, they've got their faith in those idols to do something positive for them. Hey, that's idolatry. And you know what's weird? And I'll, I'll talk about this later. But on the Sunshine Coast, there's like an epidemic, isn't it, Tim? Of, of Buddha statues everywhere. Now, here's the thing. When I used to go soul winning in Sydney, and I'd go to someone's house and I'd find a Buddha statue on the front lawn, guaranteed you're going to knock on that door and the guy's Buddhist. Okay? On the Sunshine Coast, there are statues everywhere. I, I, when I started there, I mean, look at all these Buddhists. What's going on? And then you knock on the door. Oh, no, I'm Catholic. I, I, I'm a, you know, I go to a Pentecostal church. Or, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you later on why that is. I'll get into that later, otherwise I'm getting off topic. What about Hinduism? Hinduism. You know, they've got their thousands of gods. And, you know, the two main uh, gods that I can think of is uh, Ganesha. I don't know if you guys know what Ganesha is. If, you, if you've ever seen, like, an elephant god for the Hindus, hey, they set these things up and they worship these things. They see them as, as gods. You know, like an, an animal. They take an animal. And they try to make it look like a human being, and they worship it like gods. The other one that I'm familiar with, with Hinduism, and again, they've got thousands, is, is Durga. I don't know if you've ever seen the woman with the many, many arms. You know, one of those women with many arms. That's, that, her name's Durga. You know, that's another idol that, that Hinduism has. And you say, well, what about Islam? You know, you know I'm, I'm pretty sure Islam doesn't have idolatry, you might say. Well, are, you, are you sure about that? Because, you know, in, in, in Mecca, what do they have? They have that cube. What's it called? Does anyone know? Sorry? Kaaba. 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 That's what it's called. It's called a Kaaba. And what do they do? You know, they, they go on these pilgrimages. There, there are Muslims by the, by the tens of thousands, you know, bowing down their heads toward Mecca, to, toward that cube box, whatever it is. Hey, that's an idol. You know, it's an object. What are they doing? They're bowing themselves to it, right? What did God say? Not to bow yourself to anything except the one true God. That's idolatry as well. What about uh, Judaism? Are they bowing to some objects? What's going on in Israel? You know, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. You know, Judaism is yeah, praying to this thing, bowing their head to this, this wall. To a wall, brethren. To a wall. They're bowing their heads to. Not, not even to something that looks like some creation. To, a, to, to brick walls, they're bowing. They've got idolatry as well. And of course, when you think of the, you know, the word of Christendom, you know, Roman Catholicism, number one, right? Uh, when it comes to that, you know, when it comes to Australians, uh, the majority of Australians, like about a third of Australians have no faith. But then when it comes to the Christendom umbrella, you know, a third of, of them are Roman Catholics. And what are they filled with? They're, you know, their churches are filled with idols. People's homes are filled with idols. You know, they've got those, uh, those prayer, uh, I can forget what they're called now. Sorry? Rosary beads. They've got their rosary. You know, these things are idols. These are the things they're trusting in to make their lives well, to, to, to give them, uh, uh, you know, safety and security from evil spirits. Every false religion, brethren, every major false religion in this world has idols, except for the true 
God of the Bible. He says no idols. You know, we are not to create statues that represent God or represent some other thing and bow ourselves unto those things. That is idolatry. Now, please go to Numbers 21 for me, please. Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Idols are just objects that are worshipped outside of the one true God. Okay, that's what our idols ultimately are. But please go to Numbers 21. And I want to show you a, a, a mistake that was made by the Israelites. Something that was meant to be good. Okay? And look, when it comes to Christianity, there's a lot of good things that we do. Okay? There's a lot of good preachers that you may listen to. But you know what a lot of people make mistakes of? They elevate the preacher. They make the preacher into an idol. They turn their pastor into an idol. They think their pastor can do no wrong. They think this man of God can do no wrong. You know, when you're a carnal Christian, when you're new to the faith, it's very common for someone to make the mistake of elevating a man almost like an idol. You know, almost to, to think that this is rep a representation of God on the earth, rather than having their hearts and their minds set on the God of, you know, of the universe. But look at this here in Numbers 21. Numbers 21 verse 4. And we have the story of the bronze serpent. This is why we sung, Look and Live. If you know the story here, Numbers 21 verse 4. The Bible reads, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us out, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread. Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. So the people of God, they've been taken out of Egypt, and they're complaining. They're whining, right? They're complaining against Moses. They're complaining against God. Verse number 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people in, of Israel died. This is the God of the Bible, okay? If you're whining, you're complaining about his provisions, God may very well just step in and chastise you. To the point even unto death when it comes to these Israelites, right? What does he send? He sends these serpents, these fiery serpents to bite the people. Now listen, we live in Australia. I don't know, we've got like, uh, you know, don't quote me on this, but we have like seven of the top ten deadliest snakes in the world, right? And I, when I first moved to Queensland, I was surprised. I, I, I hardly saw snakes around Sydney. But when I moved to Queensland, we saw plenty of snakes. Sometimes you're just driving your car and you just see a dead snake that's been hit by a car. And I remember when we first, I mean, when we first moved to our house, you know, uh, we saw like a red bellied black snake in the backyard, right? And like Christina was freaking out. Like she's not used to seeing that, right? Neither am I. But look, when it comes to normal snakes, you know, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. Honestly. Like if they hear noise, they hear footsteps of a human being, they're gone. All right? They're, they're unlikely to strike at you. Unless you're like about to step on them or something like that, right? Uh, unless, you know, you, you've accidentally gone into the territory or they're protecting something, they're protecting their space. That's when they'll lash out. But generally speaking, these creatures will run away, will slither away as soon as they even hear. You know, they'll be gone before you even see them because they've already picked up that as a human being. But when it comes to these snakes, God's done something to these snakes where they go where the humans are and they just start striking. Okay, they've been empowered by God to some extent. And it just shows you the hand of God, you know, how God can get angry, how he can bring judgment on God's people when he's had enough, you know, these complaining people. Anyway, that's not so much the point. Let's keep going. Verse number, it said there at the end of verse number six, and much people of Israel died. Much people of Israel died. Verse number seven. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So it's a miracle. These snakes come, they bite these Israelites, they're dying, right? they're, 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 they've got the venom that it's killing their bodies, but then Moses creates this bronze serpent and says, look, if you just look at this serpent, you're going to be healed. Okay? And of course, if you know the story, this bronze serpent was a type, was a picture of Jesus Christ. 
being brought up onto that pole. That was a picture of Jesus Christ that would ultimately be lifted up on the cross. You know, that he'd be lifted up. And all we need to do, brethren, to be saved from the venom of sin, all we need to do is to look upon Christ in faith, and we too will be healed from that. And the reason why there was a snake on that pole, you know, when you think about it, it was the snakes that came to bite those Israelites, and then he asked for a snake to be lifted up, okay? Why is that? It's because we have that venom. We have the venom of sin, right? We have sin in us. And here's the thing. When Christ went and died on the cross, he died for all our sins. He took all of our sins upon his body. He took the sins of the whole world, everyone that's ever lived upon him. The Bible says he became sin for us, okay? And so just like those serpent stri uh, strikes, the serpent was lifted up. Or just like us with the sin that we're strung with, well, Christ became sin for us on the cross. He paid for all of our sins. So that serpent, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a reminder. It was a picture of the coming Messiah. It was a picture of Jesus Christ. And then it says here in John 3, and I'll, well, well, I'll, before I read John 3, can you please go to 2 Kings? You start turning to 2 Kings, and I'm going to go to John chapter 3. You go to 2 Kings. You go to 2 Kings. John chapter 3. These are the words of Jesus. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what does Jesus compare himself to? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Okay, so what do we learn there? Jesus Christ confirming the type. The type of the bronze serpent was a picture of what Christ would do to us. Okay? 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings chapter 18, please. It'll come together now as we read this story here and why this ties into idolatry. But brethren, is there anything wrong with the bronze serpent? No. It pointed people to Christ. Okay? It's like the Sabbath days in the Old Testament. It points the people to the rest that we can have in Christ. That He would, you know, do all the work necessary for us to be saved. That we don't have to add any work. We can just rest. There's so many things in the Old Testament. So many things that were practiced and done that would just point people straight to Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with the bronze serpent. Okay? It's, it's actually a good thing to point people to Christ. But what happens, you know, many hundreds of years later here in 2 Kings 18 verse 1. 2 Kings 18 verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Very quickly. The person that we're going to be focused on here, because we had a few names, is Hezekiah. He's going to become the king, or he's becoming the king of Judah, and he begins to reign, right? It says he is the son of Ahaz. Verse number two. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. Now, just, just something for your information. When you're reading through the kings, and you, and you see this line, and they reign for this long and that long, when they mention the mother's name, take note, okay? Because his father, in verse number one, was Ahaz. And Ahaz was a wicked king, okay? An ungodly, wicked king. He did not do that which was right in God's eyes, okay? But here we have the mother mentioned, okay? And God does this because what you find with uh, Hezekiah, that he was a good king. He didn't get it from his dad. You know where he got it from? He got it from his mother, okay? His mother was influential in his development and this is why his mother's name here is mentioned you want it's, it's it, um the mother's name is not often mentioned only when you have this godly king to show you hey the mother was the one that taught him these things but look at verse number three it says here about hezekiah and he did that which was right in the sight of the lord according to all that david his father did you say hold on didn't the bible say that he was his father was Ahaz. Yeah, because Ahaz was wicked, right? And so when God thinks about the father of Hezekiah, God says, no, his father was King David. Why? Because King David was a righteous man. King David's heart, you know, was to seek the things of God, right? He, he, uh, he was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. And so spiritually, you know, Hezekiah was more like David. You know, David was more as a father spiritually to Hezekiah than what his, his biological father Ahaz was. And in verse number four, it says... He removed, this is what Hezekiah does, he removed the high places. He broke the images 
and cut down the groves. What's he doing? He's getting rid of idolatry. He's getting rid of the idols of the false of the worship toward the false gods. It says here, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Hey Hezekiah, what are you doing? Hey, that was a good statue, wasn't it? Not? That was a good pole thing. Hey, that, that was pointing us to Christ. But what does he do? He destroys it. Why does he destroy it? Let's keep going. Um, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Ne he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So what's the story there, brethren? We have something good, something that God said to do to make that, that brazen serpent, something good that pointed us to Christ, but what did the Israelites do to it? They made it into an idol. You know, instead of having their eyes set on God, on the coming Messiah, on the Son of God, they started to worship the idol. They started to worship th that bronze serpent, which God said to do, but now that they're worshipping it, now that they're burning incense to it, it's become an idol unto them. And so this righteous king, he just goes and destroys it. Okay? What I'm trying to say to you, brethren, here, is that something that is good can become an idol. You know, there are men, like I said, there are many good preachers, many good men that you can look up to. But don't make him an idol. Okay? He's not perfect. He's not God. He's going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. As your pastor, I'm going to let you down sometimes. Because I'm a human being. Don't make me an idol. You know? Serve God. That's the God that we all worship. We're all striving to worship God together. We're one body doing the works of God. Set God. You know, have your heart set on God. Have your heart to, to worship God. Have your eyes set to only please God and not to please man. Okay, and there are many things that God has done for us that are good, but don't turn them into idols. You know, God has given us so many possessions. You know, we talk about covetousness. You know, on on, uh, on Sunday, so many things that God has blessed us with, but you can turn all these things into idols. You can you can start having your heart set on possessions, your heart set on other things other than God. Hey, these things can start becoming idols, even though they started off as a good thing to have, but you've been foolish to make it into an idol. Okay. Now, when it comes to other idols, I, I just thought this was interesting. And I, talked, I, I mentioned about the, the Buddha statues, right? But more often than not, when you go to someone's house, one thing that you'll comment, I don't know how common it is these days, but I remember seeing them a lot when I was a child. They were the garden gnomes. Remember them, the little garden gnomes? The, the little, little old looking men. They kind of looked like, they looked like babies, but they were old men, right? With hats. And a lot of people have these garden gnomes in, in the garden. They say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the thing about the gnomes, I just, I'll just read out a portion here to you that I did some research here. It says that small gnome statues began appearing in Europe in the early 1600s. But the garden or lawn gnomes, as we know them today, appeared in Germany in the mid to late 1800s. Say, so, well, what's that? It's just decoration, right? Well, it then says here, the gnome was used because local myths suggested that underground gnomes came alive at night to work in the garden and protect the gardens from evil sorcery. So what are the gnomes then? You know, people started to put gnomes in their gardens to protect them from this evil sorcery, to protect them from evil spirits or something, right? So what are they trusting in then? Are they trusting in the God of the Bible? No, they started to put their trust in these gnomes, in these little objects, on these little things of clay, these little baby looking men. They made them into idols, brethren, okay? This is idolatry as well. It's like the lucky charm. This will protect us. This will protect our house. That's what the gnomes represent. And I, you know, I truly believe if you've got gnomes in your, in your house, get rid of them. Okay? Because they were created for that purpose. They were created to be trusted in that they would combat evil sorcery. Okay? And then as, as I mentioned to you, you know, the Buddha statues, that's the big thing now. You know, the New Age movement, you know, the gnomes have almost like been replaced by the Buddha statues. And like I said, I can't believe how many there are on the Sunshine Coast. You don't have to be Buddhist. It, it, it's become like the decoration. It's not the gnomes anymore. It's, it's the Buddha statues. It's all over the place. And uh, once again, those Buddha statues were there to help, you know, so-called so protect people, give them wealth, give them finances, protect them from evil things. And again, that's idolatry. You're putting your faith, you're putting your trust on those objects rather than having all your faith and trust on the God of the Bible. Now, please go to 1 Corinthians 10 for me. 1 Corinthians 10, where we had the reading from. 1 Corinthians 10. 
And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 135. You go to 1 Corinthians 10. Because as Christians, as saved, born-again Christians, I mean, do idols give you fear? Do you think an idol can hurt you? Do you think if you walk past an idol, it can put some bad spell on you or something like that? Do you think it can curse you or something like that? No, it can't, you know. I'll just read a passage to you here in Psalm 135, verse 15. Psalm 135, verse 15. It says, The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. Listen, when it comes to an idol, it's an object of nothing. It can do nothing to hurt you. It can do nothing to harm you. Okay? That's just the first thing I want you to understand, right? And, and look, even if it had some type of power of, of some evil spirits, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You're a child of God. You've been born again. The Bible says, Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world, the Bible says. Okay? So even if it could, the Bible says, Look, it can't anyway. There's nothing that an idol can do. Okay? And here's what's crazy about it. It can't do anything, but the people still worship it. All right? I mean, it just shows you. And this still happens in 2020. You know, it just shows you the heart of man. shows you the wickedness of man. But also the desire to worship something. And you know, it's our job to say, Oh, you're worshipping the wrong thing. Let me tell you about Jesus. You know, our, you know, even though it's so wicked, our hearts should yearn for these people that are desiring something. They know there's more to life than just the material. They know there's something more, but we need to tell them who it is. We need to tell them about Jesus Christ. But go to 1 Corinthians 10. I think you might be already there. Because even though the, the idol can do nothing to harm you, you know, and uh, there's still something more to an idol than you may realize, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 19. The Bible says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say unto you, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So let's think about this for a minute. What did it say in verse number 19? Is the idol anything? He said, look, the idol is nothing. Okay? But here's the thing. When people worship, when they sacrifice to these things, what does it say? It says they sacrifice to devils. Listen, when people have an idol, yes, the idol is nothing. But when they worship, when they do, when they serve, and they trust in that idol... That worship, that trust, that sacrifice is being received by devils. Okay? So even though the idol itself is nothing, there are devils behind that. You know? They have influenced people to bring that into the house. They have influenced people to worship those images. And that worship is going to false gods. It's going to idols, brethren. You know? And, you know, I honestly, you know, if you've been saved, say, from the Catholic Church, if you've been saved from some religion that has idolatry, if you still have it in your house, brethren, get rid of it. Get rid of it, okay? Because even though it's nothing, it did receive at some point some worship, you know? There was some demonic issue there, some type of spirituality that took place where that was received by devils. Now, the reason I say this is because, and, I, and you guys know I got Christina saved. You know, she's the first soul that I ever got saved. But Christina was a Roman Catholic, Okay, and and her family was very much into idolatry and very much into Roman Catholicism. All right, I think her mother would go to the church every day, every single day, right, to have the communion and all that stuff, right. And her house, and this was the influence of the next door neighbor because they were Catholics as well. You know, their house is full of full of idols, just just full of Marys and full of. I think it was like a picture of Jesus and and the saints and. All these images, you know, her, Christina's bedroom was full of these things, like the rosary beads, um, a scapulas. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys know what a scapula is. It's kind of like this thread where it's got these two images of saints, and you kind of put it on, around your shoulder, around your neck. I don't know what. And like you have one image of a saint on one on your back, and one image of the saint on the other side. I mean, they were deeply into idolatry, deeply into Roman Catholicism, and not only that, because Christina has a Portuguese background, you know, um, in Portugal. They're very Catholic, and one of the reasons is because, you know, Portugal had, you know, apparently had a, a special uh, apparition of Mary. You know, but they don't call her Mary, they call her the Lady of Fatima. 
You know, a lot of nations have had like a special revelation of Mary. And they have their own kind of Mary. I don't know if you guys are really familiar with that. Uh, it's very, a very famous story, the Lady of, of Fatima, that appeared to some children. There's also something about a dancing sun that apparently thousands of people saw, or some miracle that Mary did, right? And so when it comes to like the Portuguese especially, they're very Catholic, you know, all the way, all the way into idolatry. And as I said, Christina's bedroom was full of this stuff. She was very superstitious, you know, was trusting in these idols. And then, you know, she got saved, praise God. You know, she, she, she went from a false Jesus, she came and trusted on the true Jesus of the Bible. And, you know, and within, a, you know, I don't know how long it took, maybe a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, eventually she had the conviction to get rid of that stuff in her bedroom. She couldn't get rid of the stuff in her house, belonged to her family, right? But she got rid of the things, she got, you know, she threw them out. And, um, and what happened next? I, 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 as best as I remember the story, because it was quite a long time now, as best as I remember, I was either on the phone with her, or we were chatting on the computer. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I'll never forget this situation because I've never experienced this, but I, I trust her 100% that this story is true. And I remember, because I was there experiencing it, find what's going on, right? She got rid of the statues. She got rid of all that stuff. And then, like, let's just say we're talking on the phone. I can't remember exactly. Talking to her, and then she goes quiet. She stops communicating to me for a long time. I'm like, Christina, are you there? I don't know if, again, it could have been typing. I don't remember, but you know, I was like, what's going on, right? And it took a few minutes, but she eventually got back, you know, back to me and said, you won't believe what happened. She goes, you won't believe what happened. She goes, the reason I stopped communicating with you is because I heard a rumbling, like a deep thunder rumbling. And I was like, what is that? And she was playing some music on her. Like she was trying to become more Christian. She got rid of her, you know, hip hop and her R&B music and started to listen to, you know, Hillsong. Like she, 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 you know, she's trying, right? She just got saved. She's a baby in Christ. She's trying, right? So she thought it was a stereo. And so she turns it off. And then the rumbling continues, right? She's just rumbling, this, this, this massive sound. And then she looks at her bedroom door, and it was her bedroom door. And she says it was shaken, and it was, it, was, it was like violently shaken. And it wasn't just shaken, it was defying the laws of physics, she says. It, it, was, it was like waving. Right? It was just, it's, it's a wooden door. It's a solid wooden door, right? And it was, it was like waves. It was, it, was, it was rumbling, it was shaking. And have you ever been so scared that you just freeze, and you don't know what to do? But well, that's what happened to her. That's why I couldn't communicate with her. She just froze. She was looking at this door, just violently shaking, rumbling. And all that came out of her mouth eventually is, Jesus, help me. And as soon as she said, Jesus, help me, it stopped. It was gone. And then she came back on the phone. And I, I just said, I, I mean, I never really heard a story like that. Because obviously, you know, I got born, born in a Christian home. Um, but I have no doubt that all that worship, the family, with these idols, her own worship, her own service to these idols had gone to devils. I have no doubt there were devil there was a presence of some devils in that house and they were not happy that she had got rid of them. They weren't happy that she had turned to Christ. They weren't happy that she became a believer. And they, maybe they tried to scare her into bringing them back. I, I don't know what it was, okay? But she called on Christ, she, she named his name and it was finished. And then she opened the door, she went outside, her family was in the living room, she asked her family, were you guys shaking my door? And they were like, what are you talking about? That's what happened, that's the story. Say, why? Why did that happen? Because these idols receive devils. The, the worship is received by devils. Please do not have these objects in your house. Are you guys in 1 Samuel? Did I tell you to turn there? Can you go to 1 Samuel, please? 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. As I said, I probably... I, I'm kind of not expecting any of you guys to have idols, okay? So I do want to take... Uh, something out of this that you can sort of um, apply to your lives as well because there is something that the Bible compares to idolatry that we're all probably guilty of okay and this is then an area that we need to fix you may not have those physical objects you might not have those molten images or those graven images but you might be like soul here okay let's have a look at this first Samuel 15 verse 1 uh, Samuel also said unto Saul the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass so samuel gives this direction from god to saul he says look it's time for the Amalek amalekites to be destroyed 
go and wipe them out. What did it say? Who, who are they to slay? Men, women, infant, suckling, but little babies. Not just, the, not just the people, the ox, the sheep, the camel, and the ass. Get rid of all. Destroy them all. Is the direction from God. Okay? Let's go to verse number 8. What happens? And he took, verse number 8, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Did Saul pay attention? Did he do what God asked him to do? But God said, wipe them all out. Slay them all. He takes the king alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people sped Agag and the best of the sheep. Look at this. And the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they, utterly, they, they destroyed utterly. So God says, destroy all the animals. And as they, they've done it, they, they've, defeated, they, they've defeated the Amalekites. Well, these are good sheep. These are good oxen. Well, let's take them for ourselves. Do you see the disobedience toward God that we're seeing here with King Saul? Let's keep going. Verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, he was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him a place, and he's gone about and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth them, this bleating of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So Saul says, I've done everything that God asked me to do. And Samuel said, well, hold on, I can hear these animals. What's going on? Didn't we tell you to destroy them? Verse number 15, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and for the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So what's Saul saying? Hey, we kept it so we can serve God, so we can sacrifice these things unto God. You know, does God want sacrifice? Or does He want your obedience? He didn't obey the commandment of God. Verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. What? And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which have been, uh, have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice, Answer the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Now this is the point of the story here. Verse number 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and, and to hearken than of the fat of rams. Listen, if you do not do the things the way God asks you to do, but you say, yeah, but I'm going to serve God. I'm going to sacrifice those animals. We were talking about this last night, brother. A pastor. I just want to serve the Lord. Yeah, but you haven't got the children. The Bible says the qualifications for a pastor is to have faithful children. Yeah. Oh, but God didn't give it to me. I want to serve God. Well, does he want your sacrifice or does he want your obedience? Yeah. Right? Listen, yeah, this happens in soul time. This happens today. This happens in pastors in independent Baptist churches. Okay, they do not obey the word of God. Look at verse number 23. This is the point of the whole thing. Let's bring it back to idolatry. It says, for rebellion is, the, is as the sin of witchcraft. Look at this. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Listen, when you are stubborn, when you rebel against what God asks you to do, you know what? That's the same as the sin of idolatry. What did it say there? It is the, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Listen, brethren, you may not have the statues, okay? But when you disobey, when you're stubborn, when you rebel against God, you've committed a sin just like idolatry. Yep. Okay, why? Let's keep going. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and have also rejected thee from being king. Okay, he have also 
rejected thee from being king. So what is that? When, when you're stubborn, when you rebel, when you don't do things in obedience, oh, but I'm sacrificing, I'm serving God, but uh, no, you're, 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 you're contrary, hey, it's like sin of idolatry. That's, it's the same level of sin. And Reverend, you know, like I said, you probably don't have the statues, but all of us, when we sin, guess what? When we do, when, what happens when we sin? We're rebelling against God's commandments. When every time we sin, you know, we're rebelling. We're being stubborn against what God has asked us to do. This is why we need to learn to get the sin out of our lives, right? You know, getting sin out of your life is not salvation. But once you're saved and you're in the process of sanctification, we should be driven to get rid of those sins. We should be driven to do away the stubbornness and the rebellion against the Lord God. Because it is as the sin of idolatry, the Bible says. Because it has rejected the word of the Lord. Let me bring this a little bit closer to our church. How would I kick someone out of the church? Yes, if they try to get us to worship idols, I, I, I doubt that we would be tempted to worship idols, right? After knowing the God of the Bible and knowing what he, what he believes about this. But here's the thing. If someone causes us to reject the Word of God, it is as a sin of idolatry. What is the Word of God? The Bible. Which Bible do we use in this church? The King James Bible. Okay, we believe that the King James Bible is perfect, it's pure, it's preserved, it's a perfect translation of the original Greek and the original Hebrew. Okay, and these other modern Bibles, hey, they're perversions. They aren't Bibles. We shouldn't even call them Bibles. They aren't the Word of God. Okay, and here's what happens. When someone comes with a false Bible, okay, now listen, if someone's a visitor first time and they bring their NIV, you know, don't, don't be hard on them, okay? They're ignorant. They don't know any better, all right? In due time, we'll, we'll, I'll take that off them and I'll give them a King James Bible for free. Don't worry about that, okay? But if someone comes to this church, keeps coming and just says, no, I, I don't believe the King James Bible is right. I'm going to keep reading my NIV. I'm going to keep reading my new King James Bible. Well, they rejected. What did it say there in 1 Samuel 15, 23? Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord. Hey, if someone's coming to this church and they're rejecting to use the King James Bible for us as English speakers, if they're rejecting that, I'm also going to kick them out of church because it is as a sin of idolatry. Okay? Now, I'll, I'll give them a King James Bible for free. I'll take them off. I'll burn it for them if they want. Okay? Or, or someone else can burn it for them if they want. But listen, if someone comes with another version and is demanding and saying, no, I'm going to use this in, in church, no, you need to leave the church. Okay? You are rejecting the true word of God which we've, we've been given, thankfully, as English speakers, pe English speaking people in the King James Bible. Now, let me just show you a little bit about this because I want you to think about these other versions. And when it comes to idolatry, rejecting God's word, the stubbornness, the rejection of God's words, right? The rebellion against God's word. There are so many new translations coming out all the time, okay? And this is the last thing that I want to talk about here. But there was a version that came out just a couple of years ago, just I think two years ago. It's called the Pure Word Translation. Hey, that sounds good. The Pure Word Translation, okay? And let me just read to you a portion about this Bible. This is just a very new Bible. And again, every year there's new Bibles coming out all the time. But it says here, uh, when, when they talk about this Bible, it says, With more than 20 years of research led by Dr. Harry Miller and Brent Miller Sr. to develop more accurate proce uh, processes for English translation. So they think, well, we're going to have a more pure. We're going to have a better translation than what you have. The pure word now offers the world's first and only hermeneutics-based monadic Greek to English translation that can save scholars. Now look, this is the advantage of this new Bible apparently. To save scholars, pastors, and Bible students from the countless hours needed to retranslate the original Greek meanings for all 27 books of the New Testament. Now for those that have preached, I'm a pastor, I was named as this. this, this apparently this pure word Bible is made for me. So I don't have to spend all these hours retranslating the Bible from Greek. I never translated the Bible from Greek. I've always had the perfect Bible in English. Amen. They're not saving me time. They just want my bucks. They want my money. Why? Let me keep going. It says here, um, As a result, the pure word is not intended to replace your preferred version of the Bible, but rather to be used alongside it by anyone wanting to dive deeper into the New Testament scriptures. Okay, so this is, they're not trying to take away your old Bible. They're not trying to take away your King James Bible. They just want you to use it alongside. Oh, man, I'm glad someone's trying to help me, apparently, okay? Well, let's have a look at this. You know, let's, uh, let's look at the pure word translation. Let's look at John 3.16. Do you guys know John 3.16 in the King James? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what? 
believer, right, in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What a, what a great verse. How many thousands, how many hundreds of thousands of people have come to faith in Christ just because of that verse? Knowing what Christ has done, that he's been given by the Father, that it's just believing on him. It's just faith. It's nothing else, Jesus. Wow, what a great message. All contained in John 3.16, right? Ah, but don't worry. The Pure Words has come out to really help you understand it now. Okay, the Pure Words Bible is going to really help you now understand the fullness of John 3.16. So this is what it says here in the Pure Word translation. I'm going to read it to you word for word. Because God has loved in such a manner the Satan's world. I'm, I'm not misreading that. That's how it's written. Because God has loved in such a manner the Satan's world, so that he gave his son, the only begotten risen Christ. And then this is the bit where it says believe, right? Now, now, you, now you're going to understand what believing means. In order... That whosoever is continuously, by his choice, committing for the results and purpose of him, should not perish. But definitely should, by his choice, the, be continuously having eternal life. Oh man, now I get John 3.16. Now it's so clear because of the pure word, the putrid word translation. Okay, how did it start there? Because God has loved in such a manner the Satan's world? Does God love Satan's world, brethren? Is that why he came? To love Satan's world? No. That's blasphemy. Yeah. God doesn't love Satan's world. Yeah. God loves human beings. God loves your soul. That's why he came to die on the cross. He didn't come for Satan's world or Satan's kingdom. How stupid. Right? What else did it say? That he gave his son, the only begotten risen Christ... In order that whosoever is continuously, by his choice, committing for the result and purpose of him. I mean, you just got to keep serving. You just gotta, I don't even know, you know what this means, brethren. I don't understand. Just have the result and purpose for him, please. That's how you get saved according to, according to the putrid version. It right? should not perish. It doesn't even say believe. But def definitely should, by his choice. Look, as long as you keep the choice, you should continuously be continuously having eternal life. Continuously having it. Which means if by your choice you no longer do it, you've given up the eternal life. It's loss of salvation is what this putrid version teaches. Yeah. Brethren, this is rejecting the word of God. This is idolatry. As idolatry, I should say. Okay? As you said, rejection, the stubbornness of man to think they can come with a better version. This is the nonsense that's coming out these days, brethren. To apparently help pastors and preachers and people that are studying God's word aren't you thankful for the pure word translation of course not it's 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 rubbish okay it's rubbish and the bible says in revelation 22 18 for i testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things and what do they do they added a lot of things all right god shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophet, what did they take away? The believing. They took that away. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written, which are written in this book. Listen, this Dr. Henry Miller, this Brent Miller, you know what's happened to them right now? Their name, their, their, their names, their, their part in the book of life has been taken away. True. They're reprobate now. Yeah. Okay, and they're going to die. They're going to go to hell. God's judgment's going to be upon them. And the plagues that are written in the book of Revelation are going to be added to their torments. When they're burning the flames of hell. Okay? You see the wickedness. You know, idolatry is wicked. But so is rejecting God's word. So is tampering with God's word. This is why the King James Bible is so important. Anyway, brethren, let me just conclude with 1 John 5.20. You don't need to turn that. I can just read it to you quickly. 1 John 5.20. It says, And we know that the Son of God is come, and have given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then it says in verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And brethren, that's my message to you tonight. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's pray.